Hey guys, welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. In each episode, we're going to have conversations with some of the top investors, superstar founders, as well as well-known tech company executives in Silicon Valley. We'll have a coffee chat with them to learn their way of thinking and actionable tips on how they build or invest in a successful company. Before we start our show today, I want to make sure the listener, aka you, understand that everything a person say on the podcast only reflects to hers or his own opinion, not the show or the company they work at. Our guest today invested in LinkedIn, Twitch, Rocket Lab, and many other successful companies. He is a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. He was featured on the Forbes Midas List Hall of Fame. Appeared on the Madness list for 14 years between 2001 and 2018. He was also featured in my book How to Be a VC. His name is David Cohen. Welcome to the show, David. Happy to be here. To start off the show, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got into venture?、Uh, I drove there. <laughs> so、uh, back in 1990, I was working at Oracle as a product manager,、mm -hmm. and I saw this、uh, big fancy room. And I said, "What's that?" And someone said, "That's the boardroom." And explained to me that it was、uh, that the venture capitalists came there once every couple of months. And I remembered my dad told me about venture capitalists, and and that、uh, sounded like a really fun job.、Uh, and so I said, "Well, you know, like wh where do these venture capitalists come from?" Somebody told me that they were all at three thousand Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. And back then there was no Google Map, but I had a regular map、uh, printed out, and so I. Went out to my car and I found my way to 3000 Sand Hill Road. Drove there in my Mazda and parked, and then just started walking around.、Uh, I didn't know any of the names of the companies or the VCs themselves,、uh, but just walked into really a random one to start with, and asked the receptionist, "Hey, does this venture capital company hire people for the summer?" At that point, I had already decided to go get an MBA back east, and so I thought maybe I'll be able to find a gig for the summer. And the receptionist said, "No." I said, "Oh, well, do any of these venture capital companies hire people for the summer?" And she said, "Yes." And I said, "Which ones?"、Uh, and she pulled out a book from the shelf called "The Western Association of Venture Capitalists" or something like that. And she circled the names of five venture firms. I'm not exactly sure how this person would actually know which firms were hiring summer people, but、uh, and I wish I remember who this person was because today I would go buy her a car. Uh, but she、uh, circled those names and gave me the book, and I went back to my apartment and on my dot matrix printer, I printed out five letters. That's what we did back then. This was before the age of email, <laughs> and I sent letters to the five firms.、Uh, one of them was TA Associates, and they ended up hiring me for the summer. And another one of the five was Bessemer Venture Partners.、Mm -hmm. uh, Bessemer did not hire me, but I stayed in touch with them through my business school years and. At the end of which, they took pity upon me and hired me, and I've been there ever since. That's really cool. How do you stay in touch with them back then? Assuming there weren't any emails, did you send a letter? You know, I I sent a Hanukkah card to Neil Brownstein, and I was pretty desperate for any reason at all to stay in touch with them, and so I sent them a Hanukkah card.、Um, later on, I received a chain letter. Which seemed to be somewhat humorous, and so I sent、mm -hmm. him one of those too. If you look back at this now, it's pretty—it's like borderline stalking. <laughs>、um, and today, if somebody parked his car at you know three thousand Sandhill and started walking around, walking into offices, I, I don't think it would be as successful today、uh, as as I was in 1990.、Um, but you know, somehow、uh, I, I managed to. Stay in touch with Bessemer. I had worked at TA, but TA Associates is a much、mm -hmm. later stage venture firm. And for me, I really enjoy the early stage stuff,、mm -hmm. and that's why I,、um, you know, hounded Bessemer、uh, until they hired me. An interesting detail you mentioned earlier was that you work at Oracle as a PM. Was that your first job? And what other experiences did you have that prepared you for venture? So,、uh, I had started a software company. Mm -hmm. When I was a senior in high school, called Cambridge Data Systems, that created、uh, software for private libraries.、Um, I mean, today it's not even clear why we need public libraries, but there was a time where companies, and particularly law firms,、mm -hmm. maintained their own very active libraries. And I and I, 
And uh, my dad was a partner at one of these big law firms. And so when I was visiting him, I saw that they were writing out labels for all the magazines as they distributed it around the firm. And I said, yeah, they can get a computer to do that. And so I, I wrote a piece of software called Data Route that printed out these stickers on a dot matrix printer. And I started selling the software to big law firms. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I probably sold about, I don't know, about you know, 10 of these systems for about $2,000 each, which you know, helped me pay for my college. Um, I, I didn't know anything about the tech industry. To me, I wasn't trying to learn how to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't, I wasn't you know, preparing for a career at all in software or venture capital. I, I was just trying to you know, make some coin. Uh, and, and this was, you know, best way I could think to do it. Um, and in fact, when I was finished finishing my college years and I thought, you know, this is take some time to service this mm-hmm. and continue to sell it. And I thought I- I'm going to get a real job. Uh, I, I sold Cambridge data systems to Brad Feld, who's, you oh know, God, you know, Brad. Right? Yeah. So he had a, he also book. had a, he had a business called Feld technologies Yeah. and, uh, and Brad and I were friends during college. And so, uh, I said, I don't know what to do with this thing. He said, well, I'll, I'll give you Fell Technologies can, can run with it. And so um, uh, I guess, you know, that was my first exit. It wasn't a very big one. Uh, <laughs> and, and at the time, I, you know, this was, I have to tell you, I didn't know anything about Silicon Valley. I didn't know anything about the tech industry. Um, mm-hmm. I thought that I was going to go off into investment banking or consulting or, you know, something which back then was a more glamorous industry to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, uh, you know, it wasn't until my friends from the computer science department twisted my arm and said, you got to go interview at Oracle that I even considered working mm-hmm. in the tech field. And then, you know, after I flew out and I saw the people there and I saw what they were doing and I realized, oh, you know, you could actually, you know, technology itself is a, is, is a very exciting career. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I uh, decided to come out to Silicon Valley. And even then it was kind of meant to be a vacation, like for two years before I go back to the East Coast and do real work. Um, so I came out to Silicon Valley. And as I said, I, I uh, learned about the tech industry and became um, excited about the opportunities in venture capital. Yeah, it sounds like you made some really good friends early on, sold your company to another really famous investor. Um, as you know, Brad was also in my book, you guys were in chapter four and five. Um, I didn't realize that the venture circle was so small. It's so interesting to connect the dots. Well, yeah, I guess I guess now it seems highly coincidental, but it's true that back then there weren't that many computer science majors around, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, certainly not at Harvard anyway, where I went to college, but um, you know, even at other schools today, it's the most common c- concentration, I believe, at many colleges. And back then it was a small, tight-knit community. In fact, when I was in college, uh, really pretty much all the computer science people like me all worked in the science center, in the basement of the science center, in a job called terminal watcher. So I, I was a terminal watcher and I, I what I is would, a terminal watcher? <laughs> well, uh, we, we, you know, we, we sat at the, in the basement where all the terminals were connected to the, to the, uh, PDP 11 mini computer and the students would come down and do their homework and we would be there to help them figure out how to use these computers, uh, and we would occasionally, you know, change the tapes on the storage drives and Mm -hmm. that was it. But mostly we just did our homework and that was the terminal watching job. But I bet Mm -hmm. it would be a really interesting study to go out there and look at the terminal watchers from the 1980s and see where they are today. Because um, the the ones whom I can remember, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, have done some pretty interesting things. I mean, one of them was, um, one of the guys I worked next to was Morrison, John, John Tappan Morris, I think, uh, he was the and the accidental investor inventor of the first malware. So he wrote um, he wrote a piece of software that jumped around the computer nodes on the ARPANET to collect information, and it kind of went out of control. It and it ended up taking down the internet. Probably the only time the internet was ever taken down was by this one accidental worm. That uh, that he created. Um, he's now a professor of computer science, I think, at Cornell. Uh, he was prosecuted for federal crimes <laughs> for this accident for this accident that he uh, had, you know, uh, wrought onto the internet. Um, it, but you know, he he he's actually quite a, a brilliant researcher, and uh, 
Uh, but you know, a lot of other people that I know that mm -hmm. I remember as terminal watchers today uh, are doing all kinds of other interesting things in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Cool. I wish I knew terminal watcher was a career path to venture capital. Um, since computer wasn't that mainstream, how do you know computer exists back then? Yeah. Well, uh, it was definitely a hobbyist thing. Think today、mm -hmm. about something like consumer drones,、mm -hmm. and a lot of us know people who have drones, and maybe you went to their house and you saw them flying a drone. You、mm -hmm. thought, "Oh, that's pretty fun."、Um, that's kind of what it was like in the in the sort of late seventies and early eighties. Was that you know you knew somebody? Maybe you saw a computer somewhere, a Commodore、mm -hmm. or TRS eighty. The first computer I ever saw was a TRS eighty at my friend Adam Goldman's house, and there. There wasn't even a floppy drive. It was just a, a tape recorder that you would put a cassette tape into, and you would hit, have to hit play in order for it to, you know, output the data.、Um, and every time you wanted to record a file, you had to hit record、um, mm -hmm. on this tape drive. So,、uh, so that was the first computer that I saw. And then in 1980, IBM came out with the first IBM PC,、um, mm -hmm. and my dad, who's a very intellectually curious guy, he bought one. Um, and we had that in the house, and that was really my first exposure to computers. It was because my father had gone off and brought it into the house that I got to play、mm -hmm. with it. I learned,、um, you know, the first programming I learned was basic language, which was the language,、uh, of course, that、something? Bill Gates that、uh, popularized on MS DOS.、Mm -hmm. uh, the Turtle.、Oh, there wasn't. This is pre Turtle. Pre Turtle Basic. Sorry, Turtle、uh, was like the <laughs> earliest I could imagine、uh, with anything.、Uh, but... All this is all like ask. This is all you know. Terminals with ASCII characters,、um, uh, and、uh, and so I learned some basic, and then I learned a product、mm -hmm. called、uh, DBase Two, which、mm -hmm. was a scripting language for database management, and I used that then to create this、uh, software for legal libraries.、Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to Harvard for college,、uh, they had just had they just said we're starting a concentration in computer science. It was the first year. That、mm -hmm. it was、uh, its own thing instead of just sort of a a、uh, a curiosity of the applied math department, and、uh, and I just thought it sounded really fun. I had I had no career aspirations in tech or computer science,、um, but I just thought it was just sounded like a really fun thing to do.、Mm -hmm. So when did you realize this could be a career, and when did you make your first investment? So I talked a little bit about how I I studied computer science. I、mm -hmm. thought. I never thought it would be a career. I, my only exposure to people who knew technology were people in the IT departments.、Um, I worked for one summer at J.P. Morgan in their IT department,、mm -hmm. and I thought, like, I thought that was the sort of the ultimate of what you could do with tech was that you could support people from an IT perspective,、mm -hmm. which you know is fun for some people to do, but it wasn't what I wanted to do.、Um, and so I, I just didn't even know about the whole software world,、uh, and so. Uh, when my friend said, "Oh, go to this interview with this, you know, startup called Oracle," I, I hadn't heard of Oracle. I didn't know what they did. I had no idea. I went to this interview, and there was this guy there interviewing me named Larry Lin, who was the recruiter for Oracle. And Larry Ellison、mm -hmm. had told Larry Lin, "Go off and bring me 150 computer science majors from these 10 schools." So Larry Lin, like, he didn't care about anything other than the fact that I was, you know, a computer science major from one of these 10 schools, and he had a quota. And so, I went to this interview without knowing anything about Oracle, also without knowing anything about database management, for that matter, and and I, and actually no interest either in even going to work for this company because I, I only went to to get my friends off my back. So, like the worst possibly prepared candidate, the worst possible candidate for an interview. And two minutes into it, two minutes, he said to me, "You know,、You're、I、hired. really like you. I here's a plane ticket for you to come to California and and visit." Nobody had ever offered me a plane ticket before, and I'd never been to California. So I said, "Okay, I'll go to California." And I just thought that'll be a fun trip. And I went to California, and I saw all my friends, the terminal watchers, there. And it was February, and they were, and when I got there, we sat in the hot tub outside their one of their apartments in Foster City. And I had just flown from Boston, which is freezing, and I thought this is pretty nice life. And I went the next day, and all these folks were, you know, building software, having a great time. Seemed like a really vibrant. Atmosphere,、mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, the、uh, HR man. I had to go stop at the HR manager's office, and she said, "How was your day?" I said, "It was great," but I was sort of like, I wanted to go back to the airport, go back, and I was done with my little trip. And she said, "Well, 
what are your what are your salary expectations? And so, in the sort of like juvenile way that you know, uh, uh, you know, like an adolescent boy will be really a jerk to, you know, to a girl so that she breaks up with him or something. I was like, I I came up with some crazy number that was you know much higher than what the investment banks were offering me. And she said, well, that's a lot. And instead of saying, well, yeah, but here's why I'm worth it. I just said, yeah. <laughs> and then I, and then I said, I, I have to go, I have to go to the airport. Um, and I just thought that would be the end of it. And then two days later, a FedEx envelope shows up and it had an offer letter in it exact for exactly what I'd asked for. And that's I thought, crazy. Oh, that's, that's funny. And I, and I threw it on the side, I threw it in, like on the floor, because I still thought I had no interest mm-hmm. in it. And then I went on with my interviews with these investment bankers. And, and I remember I was like in the last round at Churson Lehman, which was the bis- biggest bank back then. And the managing director said to me, you know, so if we ask you to stay up all night and copy documents and meet an associate at the airport at 6am, is that okay? And, you know, of course, I probably told him whatever he wanted to hear. But I started thinking about my friends in the hot tub. And I thought, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should, you know, maybe I should go off and do this fun technology thing for a little while. And I actually remember going back to my dorm room literally the next day and I had to search through a pile of laundry. This is disgusting. I know I had to search through a pile of laundry to find this FedEx letter. Uh, and I, and I took it out and I decided, you know what, I'm going to try technology for at least for a couple of years. Yeah. I, uh, so the moral of the story is just have a hot tub to like recruit someone (laughs) from the East coast. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's that's crazy. That's such a fun story. Um, so that's how you got into Warco, right? And then you had the summer internship at TA Associates. What was the first time that you invested in a company? Right. So I went to Best Bessemer Venture Partners, and mm-hmm. uh, and you know I, I was the associate. There were basically a bunch of partners, and I was there, and uh, and. I started looking at startups and I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I would bring in these companies for the partners to me and they were really bad companies. I mean, they were, Mm -hmm. it it was, they, you know, they they were not, none of them were, you know, interesting investments. And so at one point, Felda Hardiman pulled me aside. He said, you know, maybe you should stop bringing in companies because these are really bad companies. And you should think about what you want to invest in and like do some, do some, strategic research and thinking and create a roadmap of what you want to do. And so for two or three months, I stopped looking at business plans and I just went out and I found the smartest people that I could meet and said, will you please spend an hour with me? Because I want to hear your thoughts about the future of technology and, and where the interesting areas are. And I started off with a list of 40 possible areas of investment in tech. And I started crossing them off for various reasons, such as, you know, um, the market's not going to be big enough, or it's commoditizing, or maybe it's mm-hmm. something that I don't know enough about, or whatever it is. And, and, I, and I started going off meeting with these people, and then narrowed it down after talking to these people to, the, to, to five areas. Mm-hmm. The people that I met with are folks, were folks like Al Lill uh, at Gartner, um, Rick Sherland, who was, the, who was a big tech equity analyst at Goldman, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, Eric Schmidt, who at the time was the CTO mm-hmm. of Sun. Mm-hmm. And I went to talk to Eric um, and a couple of others that I, you know, sort of met along this journey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I, I came back to the partners at Bessemer. I said, okay, you know, I, I've thought about it. And the areas I want to invest in are these, you know, startups who are particularly going to lead in the areas of asynchronous transfer mode, which was a protocol that united telecom and datacom, um, network management, uh, network security, which was actually quite provocative because nobody had invested in security at that point. Um, and, I, and I thought it might be a time that people start caring about this because of the ARPANET was allowing multiple com- mm-hmm. companies to share information on the same network for the first time. And I thought mm-hmm. maybe people would care about rules for that. Um, and then, uh, one other one was uh, wavelength division multiplexing, which was, which was a way of sending different colors over the same fiber. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that led me to an investment in a company called Sienna, which does that, which is the leader in that space. And then finally, this fifth thing, which 
I said, you know, there's this thing called the internet, which I think mm -hmm. might be interesting. So this was in, and I did this in about January, in like December 92 or January 93. And mm -hmm. none of the folks there had heard of the internet. And so I kind of explained what it was and why I thought it might be interesting. And so with those five technologies identified, I went out and started mm -hmm. proactively calling up startups that I could find who were, who were leading in these areas. And that was a very different motion than waiting for business plans to come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, it was a very successful approach. A lot of the success, though, was, was dumb luck. I mean, I, I, I was you know, the tech investor at a venture capital firm from 1992 to 1999. And it's, that was like the greatest years ever to be picking tech companies. Um, but this, this proactive approach, you know, I think helped me a lot. And then since then, it's become standard practice at Bessemer. And, mm -hmm. you know, almost all the investors at Bessemer build roadmaps today and uh, invest off of those strategies. Yeah, that definitely is a really smart approach. So when you're finding these smart people, what's your definition of smart? Are they successful people manages a big company or are they experts in a particular technology? Also, how do you find them? Are they from work or did you read about them from a newspaper? Right. Well, um, in one way, it's very different from today. In another way, it's the same. Um, the way that it's different is that, well, let me just start by, by answering the first question. I wanted to get a range of opinions. So I wanted to get opinions of people who buy technology. So I wanted to talk mm -hmm. to, at the time, they were called vice president of IT. There were no CIOs mm -hmm. back then. Um, so find people who had IT budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, find, like I said, an equity analyst uh, in, in technology from an investment bank, who was the mm -hmm. best one that I could think of was Rick Sherlin. Find the best research analyst at, at Gartner. So Al Lil was like, was the best back then. Um, you know, find the greatest CTO and that was Eric Schmidt. And so I, I you know, I, I thought I want to have different kinds of, I talked to, I wanted a tech entrepreneur. I talked to uh, Per Sunaby who built a company called Codex and then sold it to Motorola and he was running it within mm -hmm. Motorola. So I wanted to get entrepreneurs, customers, equity analysts, guard, and and so I thought about these different people. So, um, so back then there was no LinkedIn, there were no websites, there was no way to reach out to these people. Mm -hmm. um, but today, even if you even with LinkedIn and even with these things, you can't if you just send an email to somebody yeah, no like this, gonna, they're they're not going to respond, yeah. and so. I really had to go to the partners of the firm and say, do you, any, like, do any of you know these people? And, you know, within the partnership, these are, of course were experienced entrepreneurs and investors, and they had, you know, been in the industry a long time. And among them, they knew how to get to these people. They, most mm -hmm. of them were friends with these people. And so, mm -hmm. um, and so they introduced me and, and that's how I got to them. Yeah, so that's a great strategy to have the quote unquote I doubt supervision to make the introduction. So after you got to talk to these experts, how do you keep in touch with them? Besides being smart and asking intellectually stimulating questions, what are some actions that you took to provide value and building an effective investing network? So <clears throat> on a scale of one to 10, I would give myself a one on cultivating my network. <laughs> By the way, Grace, I would give you a 10, okay? Thank you. Oh my God. You are, Can I just use you the same are, commercial? You are the superstar. Of, no, you're the superstar. Networking. Well, I, there's no doubt that, you know, it would have served me well to, uh, to continue to stay in touch with these brilliant people I met, um, as well as all the other brilliant people that I've met during my years, even back in school. And I've never been very good at doing that. Um, it's just not, you know, it's just not my, you know, it's just within my constitution and my skill set and all that, it's very difficult for me to, um, to go through the steps that you need to. So, so the answer is I haven't. And I, and I like, but that's like one of the things that I'm just not good at. I don't think that's the truth. Um, let's go back to your story. You pick the smart tech friends from the hot top over your friends from New York who were bankers. You created a list of smartest people you want to meet and you leverage your firm's partners to successfully meet them in the first place. 
So as a result of meeting these people, you invested in companies like LinkedIn or Twitch. On your anti portfolio, your friend Susan slash the CEO of YouTube invited you to her home to suggest you to meet the founders of Google. So I think you did great. So by the way, clarification, just so I don't, so credit is given where it's due.、Uh, I I I was Bessemer's board representative to LinkedIn, but it was Jeremy Levine who actually、mm-hmm. found the deal and recommended it to the partnership.、Um, so、uh, so credit to Jeremy Levine for that. Uh, I actually, now that you talk about it, I realize I actually did the opposite of cultivating my network.、Um, <laughs> I, I was. You're right that I have. I made. I've made a lot of friends over the years. I, I love staying in touch with my friends, and I, and I, I think I'm probably pretty good at it because I really enjoy it.、Um, what I've never done is actually cultivate those friendships for business opportunity and. And you know the fact that I found myself in that hot tub was like accident. I wasn't trying to do that.、Um, and you know, and there I am, like I'm, you know, dear friends with Susan Wojcicki, and I actually, you know, and I actually, you know, do everything I can not to, not to collaborate with her on this, you know, startup that she's at called Google. Like I, I'm, I, I'm actually, I. So yeah, now that you talk about it, I feel. <laughs> I'm not a one out of ten. I'm like I'm like a negative five <laughs> out of ten because I actually work to against. I'm actually anti cultivating. So some <laughs> thank you. I, I need to work on this. And I and I look at you, Grace, and I see how you stay in touch with people in such a, a positive and and thoughtful way. And you know I, I I'm going to learn from that. No, no. Oh my God, I'm gonna blush. Like I have foundation on, but like I'm, I already like blush, and then I'll give you like five hundred dollar after this interview, just so that you said this these things about me. But anyway, thank you so much. I, I, I take so- credit cards, by the way. You can send me Venmo、oh、or credit cards, or yeah, totally. I'll send you a physical credit card as credit card.、Uh, anyway, yeah.、Uh, so send me a physical credit card, though. I'm gonna have to、uh, quarantine it for two days. Oh my God!、Uh, before I <laughs> swipe it. Yeah,、uh, for sure. You have to find a place to actually swipe it because you can't really swipe it at home. So, I mean, unless you have like one of these machines that you can swipe it. Going back to investing strategies, can you walk us through a particular investment you've made, from how you meet the founders to your thought process of making an investment? A lot of times, good startups will be oversubscribed by investors. How do you convince them that you and your team are right for them? Yeah, that's a good that question,、part. and I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to avoid answering it in the following way, which which is that, which is well, let me.、Uh, hmm. There are two different kinds of venture capital, and when I and when I got into the business, there was only one kind. And the, when I got into the business, it was it was find you know companies that are going to become big companies, and figure out that these are good businesses. And if you figure out that something's a good business, then in, then invest. And what happened? And, and that sounds like well, isn't that what all venture capital is? The answer is no, because because somewhere around sort of the global crisis, actually so, between the dot com burst and the and the global crisis of two thousand eight, public investors became much more skeptical about companies going public. And today. Companies don't go public until they're worth billions of dollars, and so, and so companies. It used to be that when a company got to twenty million of revenue, or twenty-five million, or thirty-five million of revenue, it was going public.、Mm-hmm. Today, you have to be like well over a hundred million dollars of revenue to go public, and that's recurring revenue, which is very high quality revenue. So you're you're already worth you know over a billion dollars when you're going when you're going to go public. So. The venture capital asset class now supports private companies from that stage of fifteen million dollars a year of revenue up through over a hundred, and and during that phase of growth, where the company is worth somewhere between a hundred million and a, and and you know a billion dollars, there is no longer any question that this is a valuable business. You don't have to be a, you know,、uh, a PhD in engineering or whatever to look at the technology and figure out that this is important. 
you can look at the sales numbers and you can see, okay, there's real traction here. And without understanding the technology so deeply, you can say, this is a great business. And for that kind of venture capital, the hardest thing about it is not deciding whether it's a good business. It's convincing the company to work with you as their partner. And so, you know, a lot of what we do at Bessemer and a lot of what lots of venture firms do, and I would say Andreessen Horowitz kind of, you know, was one of the firms that really innovated in this space was to explicitly promote your venture firm as a great partner so that when you find these good companies, they will work with you. Mm -hmm. And so that, so, you know, and, and so at Bessemer, you know, we work really hard at that and specifically in the areas where we believe we have strengths, like in cloud computing, you know, we believe that we can bring cloud computing companies, you know, very specific benefits that they can't get from any other firm. And that's something that, that wins us deals and makes us successful. Now in the original kind of venture capital, which is still practiced in the early stages, I have to tell you, it's not that hard to convince a company to take your money. It's, you're, we're talking about businesses where it's not clear that they're going to be so successful. Mm -hmm. So these companies don't have such an easy time. It's not, you know, it's not, it, mm -hmm. it's, they're going off trying to raise money to whatever, build a rocket or a quantum computer or some weird new food synthesis source or something like that. And if you show up, and you understand the technology and you say, you know, I share your vision and I see this and I think this is going to be a, a, a very, very important company, then, you know, you do the deal. For the early stage, you know, it's really about just trying to understand the area well and, mm -hmm. and, and make some hard bets. You know, like you try to really, um, you know, pick the not like you, you, you just, just make the hard calls. And when you do that, there's usually not a lot of competition for those companies. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you mentioned earlier that you will research and find an industry or an area that's promising. So after you selecting that area, how do you know which company is going to be the number one in that industry? Can you give us an example of a time that you pick company A versus company B? Oh, that's sure. Yeah. yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is, this is a very common uh, approach for me, which is I've done a roadmap and the roadmap tells me I want to invest in a company that does something. And then I will go, I will go find all the startups that are doing that and try to learn as much as I can about all of them. And then typically uh, pick a winner. And I pick the winner really based upon, usually based just upon the team. Um, but when I say based upon the team, that's sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the quality of the team and the decisions that that team has made regarding how they're going to market and what they've built. Um, so, uh, so for example, it's not always the team. Um, you know, I, I uh, was working in, in uh, bank security. I was, I was an investor in a company called Sciota back in the early 2000s. And based upon what I learned at that company, which it was a very successful company helping banks with fraud. I realized that, that the hackers were moving away from hacking businesses where there really wasn't much money to make. And they were going after individuals through, uh, to basically what we call now identity theft. It, it didn't, it didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, some startup is going to have to help protect consumers because the hack, there's so much money to be made from, from spoofing these consumers. And we didn't call it identity theft. We called it credit application fraud. That's what the mm -hmm. banks called it. Basically, somebody applying for credit on your behalf. That's the, that's, I mean, when we talk about identity theft, that's the most common way to monetize identity theft. So we mm -hmm. called it credit application fraud. And I thought, you know, somebody's got to do something about this credit application fraud stuff. Nobody else was thinking about it um, from a venture perspective, but there were a few startups that were, Toying, that were playing with different solutions in it. Uh, a couple of them were very Silicon Valley archetypal startups who were thinking about technical ways to use data to figure out, you know, whether an application was fraudulent or whatever. And 
the teams who were working on those looked like Silicon Valley teams. In fact, one of them was mm-hmm. uh, uh, somebody from Postini, where I had been an investor. Mm-hmm. And um, so they looked like... But then uh, an analyst at Bessemer uh, told me, called, told, said to me that he reached out and he found this little company in Arizona that mm-hmm. was also doing... That also had a solution. Um, and they didn't seem to have any technology really to speak of at the time, mm-hmm. um, but they had tons of customers and they seemed to be growing fast. So I flew out to Arizona and I met this little company called LifeLock, which was like, you know, less than a year old. Mm-hmm. And, they, and, and they were just really focused on customer service and signing up customers and being great at customer service. And they were doing, they had a technical solution, but they had basically outsourced the technology to other products that they just bought. They were built, they were buying, not building. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, and I, and the people who started it, I have to tell you, I mean, they won't mind if they see this podcast, they would agree that they were not your sort of like blue chip resumes. Okay. Mm-hmm. These were, these were like, you know, people who, you know, they, you know, they'd done interesting things in their lives, but they hadn't started successful companies that they had exited and they had, you know, and, um, uh, but they were just super scrappy and, and, you know, really focused on, on making, you know, working on customer service. And I just thought in this case, for this mm-hmm. opportunity, this mm-hmm. consumer uh, zeal is going to be more important than the technology perspective. And so, um, so we bet on LifeLock. We led the series A round and many rounds after that and ended up eventually selling it to Symantec for two and a half billion dollars. Um, other example, you know, when I, when I sold Skybox to, to, uh, to, to Google, mm-hmm. one of my learnings from that was that we were able to build this Microsat constellation. The hardest thing about deploying a successful Microsat constellation was actually launching it because mm-hmm. all of the rockets that existed back then were designed to launch multi-ton satellites to geosynchronous orbit. They were huge, enormous spacecraft that you would buy for hundreds of millions of dollars years in advance. And if you were trying to put up, you know, small satellites one at a time in specific places, you couldn't use these big rockets. Um, you could try to do rideshare, but mm-hmm. you had to then go to whatever altitude someone was going to at whatever inclination, and you had to wait years for it to happen. And it was just, it just didn't work. And so I, and so uh, when we created a, a space roadmap that year, one of the opportunities on it was we have to find a startup that's going to solve the problem of launch for Microsat constellations. So I looked at different companies trying to do it, including Firefly and some others. But there was this one company in New Zealand called Rocket Lab. Mm-hmm. And what I really loved about Rocket Lab there was the team and specifically the, the founder, Peter Beck, who was just, you know, a super brilliant, passionate uh, entrepreneur. He grew up in this little fishing village in New Zealand and he and his brother would, you know, like build rockets in their dad's garage mm-hmm. or something. And he never had any other job in his life other than just building rockets. Um, he started this, you know, this th- right out of school, he created this little company to, tr- you know, get DARPA contracts where they built, you know, suborbital, su- you know, sounding rockets and mm-hmm. whatever they could, he just wanted to like, that was what he loved. And, and they were really good at it. And so mm-hmm. when, when Elon Musk pivoted away from small payloads by taking the NASA contract. Um, Elon canceled the Falcon 1 project and started building Falcon 9s. Uh, Peter Beck said, I'm going to go build uh, a, a company to service small payloads and Microsat constellations. And so, uh, so that's why we invested in Peter and Rocket Lab. Yeah, that's really interesting. How do you learn about the rockets and having ideas that are really forward thinking? Um, how do you discover and educate yourself about things that are not that obvious for the general public? Yeah, so there's two ways. One is that um, I work at a venture firm that has really come to value the uh, importance of learning new areas for the mm-hmm. investors. Uh, and we say that because Bessemer has been around longer than any venture firm. And I think the reason is that we're very good at reinventing ourselves and creating new strategies. And, it, and uh, you can't do that by hiring experts every time you want to change your strategy. Mm-hmm. If you hire expert investors, those expert investors are just going to keep investing in what they're expert in. Mm-hmm. You need to find people who are critical thinkers, who are uh, and intellectually courageous enough to stop doing what they're doing before that was working and start to learn how to do something different. Mm-hmm. And so. It, and so 
in order for us to continually uh, refresh our strategies, one thing is we have to hire people who have the skills and, and intellectual courage to do that. But the other thing is we have to give them time to do it. We have to say, if you want to go off and learn a new area, go do it. Take six months or 12 months or 18 months, whatever it takes. If you don't make investments during that time, that's okay. But come back with, you know, with, with, uh, well, come back with some, you know, with some informed, uh, strategy as opposed mm-hmm. to, you know, something that, you know, you, you read on TechCrunch that day. Um, mm-hmm. so, so that's part of it. And then the second thing is that we hire, mm-hmm. uh, operating partners and executives and residents who mm-hmm. are experts in these things. And mm-hmm. so when I said, I want to build a space roadmap, I'm not, I, I wasn't a, an aerospace engineer. I hadn't mm-hmm. worked at a space company. I, I made this one investment in Skybox and I learned something from that. But, you know, I really wanted to make sure that we were going to, that we were going to be well informed in our strategy. And so, uh, at Bessemer, we brought in, um, we brought in as an, uh, an operating partner, Scott Smith, uh, who recently passed away. Uh, but Scott Smith was with us for many years and he was the, uh, one of the co-founders of GOI. He was the COO of Digital Globe. And then he was also the president of Iridium uh, for many years wh- while he was an operating partner with us. And so it was great to have him on the team. We also recruited an executive in residence named uh, Ray Johnson, who had just prior been the chief technology officer at Lockheed Martin in charge of all development and operations of aerospace projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, we had, you know, the two greatest people in, in, mm-hmm. on the planet to help us to make sure that we weren't going off the rails in our strategy. I'm curious about does having an operational advisor actually works since the operator is a person who had experience in a particular type of company. When they're giving advices, can they provide very tailored strategies that each portfolio company needs? And how well can their advices be executed by the team? Yeah, I, I, I actually agree with you. And we do not impose strategy onto the companies we invest in. So, um, when I talk about bringing in the operating partners and the mm-hmm. and the EIRs, that's to inform us and help us with our <laughs> with our with our own strategy inside mm-hmm. of Bestimers. We think about what companies to go fund, mm-hmm. um, and so you know that once we make an investment, you know Scott Smith, Ray Johnson, others, they've they have gone on to the boards of these companies, mm-hmm. but they've gone on not as the investor representative. I'm going to tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. But as an independent director who is recruited by those companies, we never impose them. The, those mm-hmm. companies would recruit them and, and actually, you know, have them there as advisors, uh, but, as, but as advisors, because you're right, every company has to make its own decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Ray Johnson, for example, he's, he's uh, on the board of Forever Oceans, which is a um, robotic fish farm company I, I funded. Mm-hmm. You he's also, yeah. yeah, he's also on the board of uh, Rigetti. Uh, computing, which I also invested in. Um, and he was actually on that board before I invested. So again, not imposed by us, but uh, recruited as an independent director. Mm-hmm. In terms of sitting on board of the companies, from your observation, are those ones who closely follow the advice from the board were more successful or the ones that making decisions on their own? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I I can definitely think of exa- of examples of of either model. So um, there there are definitely companies mm. uh, that have been super successful where the CEOs, you know, are I would say have minimalist kind of board interaction, mm-hmm. and there are others where CEOs you know do a great job of engaging their boards and getting a lot of value out of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say. You know, the one thing that I think I can say, not, not even universally, but, but very largely, is that, is that successful teams are very honest with their boards mm. and don't spin the data and, and, you know, present what's real. So mm-hmm. even those CEOs who don't, you know, use their boards very much, um, the good ones are, are very transparent nonetheless. Um, even if they're not solicitous of, of advice. 
I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. So if I'm running a company as a founder, I may have to keep advocating for my startup to keep talking about the good part instead of the challenges. So when I go to the board, I will have a polished presentation because assuming the VCs has invested in many companies, they probably will pay most attention to the ones who will have a bigger success. So for the short term benefit of my company, I probably won't really. Reveal any of my flaws.、Um, so, how do you prevent people from doing that? You're not completely wrong that people do that, but I would say it's completely wrong to think that that's a good thing to do.、Um, and I, I should qualify that because I've definitely seen, seen situations where inexperienced investors, and there are lots of inexperienced investors out there,、mm-hmm. freak out when the team reports variances from plan. Mm-hmm. And those inexperienced investors start pointing fingers, and will sometimes they'll make really bad decisions, like saying we should fire people because they're off plan.、Um, uh, experienced investors know that every company、mm-hmm. will will go through、uh, will go through outcomes that are that vary according to the original plan.、Mm-hmm. There are always variances to plans. There's no reason to freak out because something is not following plan.、Mm-hmm. Um, the only reason to freak out is if the team either is hiding it or is refusing to engage in any conversation about what to do about it. Look, I mean, I can't emphasize enough to you or to anyone who's listening to this podcast. Right when you're when you're in that boardroom, and in fact, even before you get to the boardroom,、mm-hmm. when there's something that's Worrying you or anything, even if it's not worrying you, there's just there's something going off plan. Tell your investors, tell your board, and have a conversation that says, "Here's what's happening. Here's here's why we think it's happening, or why we suspect it's happening. This is what we're doing to understand it, and this is what we think we can do in order to get things back on track." And there's actually there's like there's nothing more assuring to investors than to than to hear that kind of. Engagement back and forth.、Um, so, you know, and, and in some ways, our job as investors, when we come into these board meetings, is not to find fault. It's not to you know figure out what's going wrong. It's it's part of our job is to ask questions on a regular basis、mm-hmm. that prompts the team、mm-hmm. to check in on how things are going. Right? We had a plan. How are we doing in that plan across hiring, across revenue, across spending, across whatever it is, partners, and come back and report in the board meeting and tell us how you're doing.、Mm-hmm. And if we weren't there asking, then you might not get to it because there's a hundred other things demanding your attention every day.、Um, but there's a board meeting coming up in two weeks, so why don't you like start thinking about how you're going to like <laughs> check in with your team and figure out what you're going to tell your investors because、mm-hmm. now's like a good time to. Like check in and look at the forest for the trees. So、um, our job is to ask those questions. Team's job is to come in, give an honest, you know, feedback on it. Let us know what's going well, what's not going well. Maybe we've got some ideas on, you know, how to help.、Um, you know, it's it's always fun to, you know, it's like it's easy to poke fun at VCs and、mm-hmm. talk about all the stupid things that we that we suggest in board meetings. And you know, most of the things we suggest are probably stupid, but That's okay. You listen to them.、Mm-hmm. Throw out nine of them. Maybe that tenth one is really going to be helpful, right?、Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, right? You've already got us in the room, you know. So when we say something dumb, you could say, "Oh well, you know, I'll take that under consideration,"、mm-hmm. and we know what that means. And then,、um, but then every once in a while, we it turns out we could be helpful. Yeah,、uh, that's a great advice. So let's go back to the investment research. You previously mentioned that you would take six months off to study an investment area. What are the first three actions that you would take to become an expert in that industry? Right. Well,、uh, there's all kinds of things that you can read. You know, whether it's books or articles, or you know, do just start seeing what what's out there in TechCrunch and PitchBook、mm-hmm. and you know things in the investment community. But the best thing to do is to really dig down, not not to look at the investment layer, but to look、mm-hmm. fundamentally. So, if you want to learn about additive manufacturing, then go to the additive manufacturing users group. 
right? Mm-hmm. Go to, like, talk to the people, not the investors or the reporters, or whatever. Go talk to the people who actually, you know, are buying 3D metal printers and using them and figure out what, what they want. You, here you can use resources like Gerson Lehrman Group and others where they have expert panels of people and they can mm-hmm. find people who are, you know, doing that. Oh, I'll, mm-hmm. you know what? I'll give you a good example. Uh, about two years ago, I started thinking we really should figure out quantum computing and mm-hmm. what our roadmap is going to be around that. And I started building a roadmap around quantum computing. And, um, and I started, and I went out there and started talking to professors. You know, mm-hmm. I talked to all the, by the you meet all the startups, talk to all the entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. The entrepreneurs are the best source of information because mm-hmm. they'll just like cut through and tell you what's going on. But I also went and talked to professors and the professors I talked to, they all had, what was interesting is each one had a different, uh, had a different answer and they were pretty certain about it. One would say it's superconductors. Another would say it's trapped ions. Another one would say it's photons. Some professor said quantum computing doesn't work. It's a hoax. Don't believe it. Like, and they had these, and then, and then I stepped back and I said, you know, maybe talking to professors is not that helpful. Mm -hmm. Instead, let's talk to the customers. Let's talk to the scientists inside of the companies who actually will be buying quantum computers. So my team and I started going off and finding the PhDs inside of the pharmaceutical companies and the materials companies and the chemical companies who actually were running the research projects using supercomputers today. These, they, they had budgets of tens of millions of dollars a year they were spending on supercomputers. Mm-hmm. And these were the people, these were the, precisely the people who are, who are interested in using quantum computing to solve mm-hmm. problems that they can't solve today on supercomputers. Mm-hmm. And so we created a panel called the uh, Quantum Computing Fellows Panel. And we have 18 of these PhDs today, and we get together twice a year to talk about what we're seeing in terms of new technology trends, what kinds of problems we're trying to solve. The PhDs are talking to each other about what problems they're using, what, al- what kinds of algorithms they're creating in quantum mm-hmm. computing. And you know, we created this unique community in, in, in the world, and, mm-hmm. and we talked to them about what they were seeing and what they wanted to do. And it was based upon their feedback that we determined that Rigetti Computing was the, mm-hmm. was the winner in the space. Yeah, I really like that you and your team were taking actions to build your own research team to um, create a solution for a problem. So, by the um, way, first I had to figure out what quant- how, like how quantum computing works. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think I that's to, really hard. <laughs> that was that was a that was hard. The the uh, the the for anyone who wants to learn the, e, the like the the best starting point is a book called Q is for Quantum. Terry Randolph or something. That one is the easiest one to start with, and I recommend that. And then from there, there are, there are the book has like only five hundred pages, I assume. No, no, no. Q is for quantum. In fact, you don't even need any math to read that one. Okay, and then once once you get through that, then you can go on to some others. Don't go with uh, quantum computing for dummies. You know the for dummy series. <laughs> I I that book like on page one it says anybody can read this. All you need is um, to have completed you know, university level courses in quantum physics and to be f- familiar with Hilbert spaces. So, um, so which is probably not, you know, most of us, uh, yeah. but, uh, but Q is for quantum. That's the one I recommend. Awesome. Let's check it out. So for the last part of our episode, I have three questions for you. Who made the biggest impact in your career? What is a good book that you recommend people to read? And who would you invite to your dinner party? Okay. Uh, so the person who had the biggest impact on my career is, uh, would be Felda Hardiman. He's a, a math professor, venture capitalist, business school professor. He's been a partner at Bessemer for decades. Uh, and he's the, he's the a uh, person who mentored me as a venture investor and, uh, and as I mentioned, among other things, uh, uh, sent me out on my first roadmap expedition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I learned how to manage deals and be a good board member by following him around. For a, let's see, next question was dinner party. Um, this is not just a wish. At some point, I will... I will uh, get Tim Minchin over for dinner. So Tim Minchin, 
he is he is the most brilliant singer songwriter out there in the world today. Um, you know, some of you in the older demographic may remember Tom Lehrer, who was a you know a great humorist uh, musician. But you know, this guy's like Tom Lehrer squared. He writes uh, brilliant musicals like um, Matilda and Groundhog Day, uh, but he also writes a lot of brilliant songs. And if you go to YouTube, search for his songs. Uh, uh, for example, Storm is a great one, uh, and my favorite, White Wine in the Sun. So, uh, but he really brings together um, my passions, both for musicals, but also mm-hmm. for skepticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing that's common to Tim's music and his art is is a uh, uh, a, a you know a uh, love of of blasphemy. And a you know a a call to question things and to you know um, as he would say you know ideas ideas uh, are not worthy simply because they've been tenacious um, and that really gets to the heart of what I'm talking about when I say you need to be intellectually courageous as a as a venture capitalist you also need to do so as a person and. Um, that sounds so, like a really, really Tim's deep my hero. musical person. <laughs> yeah, go check yeah. it out. Listen to his music. Uh, it's great. Yeah. And then so, in terms of books, yeah. uh, boy, there are so many great ones. I, I, you know, the, you know, probably uh, the Devil's Chaplain is the book that changed my life the most by Richard Dawkins, but that's mm-hmm. not has nothing to do with venture capital. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I'm not a, a, uh, I, I don't really take to the business genre of books. Um, a lot of the opportunities that exist in the world today are opportunities that have to do with concepts like neural networks and other emerging properties of chaotic networks. And so reading books by Douglas Hofstadter would probably be, I just think intellectually, um, for me, Douglas Hofstadter books have been the most intellectually uh, powerful books for me. Yeah. Yeah. The mind's eye, Gerda Lesher Bach, uh, those two in particular. Awesome. So we're done with the official interview, but before we let you go, can you tell us a little bit more about your TV show and acapella group? Sure. Uh, well, the acapella groups and acapella group, uh, I would rather talk about the TV show because it's, it's much more relevant to, <laughs> to venture capital. It's called, yeah. uh, bubble proof. Um, go to, if you go to bubbleproof.tv. Uh, you'll see two, you'll see a few different films and, and TV series there. Um, the ones that I've been most involved in is a series called Bubble Proof and another one that we just released this week called Bubble Report. And uh, what we do in these is uh, my friend Michael Furtick and I really poke fun at venture capitalists who often take ourselves too seriously and who, uh, you know, think of ourselves as masters of the universe when in fact we're you know, we're, we're all riding the coattails of brilliant entrepreneurs. Um, and so, you know, this is, these, these series are mockumentaries about, uh, about, you know, the egos and insecurities and vanities of, of venture capitalists. And, and we have lots of great, um, cameos by, by, uh, people in the industry, like, like Dave Hornick and Jason Pressman and Byron Dieter and Anne Mirico from Floodgate and yeah. uh, Mike Maples and lots of other folks who show up and, and play themselves and uh, have a good time. <laughs> so what inspired you to create the show? Well, I think it's always funny to uh, expose the cognitive flaws that, that, that we fall into as people. Um, for venture capitalists, there's one that's actually for all Silicon Valley, and that's really what this show is about. There's this fear of missing out that grips people. And because we have, and, you know, we all have whatever it is, the, the sibling or the friend or the roommate or the classmate or somebody who struck it rich by being at Uber at the right time or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, all of us in Silicon Valley also have, you know, we've all had opportunities to go join some company that later went on to become a great unicorn, either as an, as an employee or an investor or what have you. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and we think, oh, I should have done it. I should have done that thing. And, and so next time I won't be so, 
I won't be so uh, cautious. I won't be so skeptical. Mm-hmm. And, and so the fear of missing out causes us to be less skeptical. It causes us to suspend uh, our common sense. And, and it causes us to, to embrace ideas without evidence, which is exactly why companies like Theranos were so successful at you know, perpetrating the, the fraud that it did. is because everybody wanted to believe. Everyone just said, even though you know, this breaks whatever rules I've known about biotech companies, you know, this feels like, you know, a visionary with something that other people think is being, is awesome. And that kind of analysis, uh, you know, is, is a pathology in Silicon Valley. And it's, and it's funny to laugh at, and hopefully in the process of laughing at others doing it, we also, uh, maybe, can stop ourselves from doing it as well. Yeah, the show is really well produced and people should totally check it out. Great. Well, I hope you all enjoy it. And please tell your friends because, uh, <laughs> because we don't have a marketing budget. So it's all word of mouth. It's hope, really good production it. quality. It's like really good okay. production quality. And a lot of jokes are really funny. And, and you're it as a leading character. Well, thank you for the plug. I, 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 hope, you do wa- I hope you continue watching it. Okay. okay. Grace, Thank well, this has so been much. really fun. Thank you I hope, so much. Uh, you and your listeners all stay safe and healthy and comfortable and, and um, look forward to, uh, to seeing you again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. You too. So yeah, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Smart Venture Podcast. If you like it, please hit subscribe so you don't miss any tips from the experts. If you want to see more behind the scene, please go to Smart Venture Pod. If you want to connect with me, all my socials are at GraceGone GG. Besides LinkedIn, it's just GraceGone. See you next time.